Okay, what about agriculture? So what's going on in, in agriculture? Well, I just have a very, very brief summary from this uh, case uh, uh, report. And uh, the, the main findings are summarized here. High concentrations of nutrients, bacteria, in streams and other surface waters and shallow groundwaters in agricultural areas. Okay, so no big surprise there from, from this report. Uh, concentrations often exceeded water quality guidelines, and there were also detections in many cases of uh, 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 pesticides, but usually below the drinking water guidelines. So we know that there's some water issues in, in agriculture. But I want to draw your attention to one pesticide in particular. Um, I had the opportunity last week at the University of Alberta to go to a presentation by a fellow named uh, Tyrone Hayes. He's a professor at University of California, Berkeley. Probably the best scientific presentation I've ever heard. And uh, the most frightening results I'd ever seen. Uh, he's commonly known as the frog man. And for many years, he's been looking at the effect of atrazine on frogs. And the results were really scary. And I'll read you the titles if I, I can. My eyes aren't very good, but hermaphroditic demasculinized frogs after exposure to the herbicide atrazine at ecologically relevant concentrations. This is the point. He's looking at concentrations below a part per billion and seeing these effects. Another paper, and this is the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the USA, atrazine induces complete feminization and chemical castration in, in male frogs. And I just wanted to, to, to point this out to you, okay? Um, we're not talking about the toxicity of the pesticide. What we're talking about, its function as an endocrine disruptor and functioning as a sex hormone and basically converting the males to females, okay? I can't speak for all of us here. I'm a male. I'm happy to be male. I've never wanted to be anything else. Um, I just wanted to draw your attention to these, these studies. I, I did do my homework. 2008 Alberta, 6,000 kilograms of atrazine is used. I know most of it is used in the, in the Corn Belt United States. I just mention this as something for us to think about. Again, we're not talking toxicology, we're talking their function as endocrine disruptors. The other one I want to talk about is antimicrobial agents. And this is a scoping study, and uh, they looked at uh, surface waters. And they were detecting antimicrobial agents. Um, again, I, I can't read it, but it's about 107 out of 240 samples detecting antimicrobial agents in, in surface waters. And this is very much a, a concern. Um, in a subsequent study, they showed, and I know you can't, can't read that, um, but you're not supposed to, they showed that these antimicrobial agents slow down the rate of decomposition of manure. And they should, they're antimicrobial agents, and what's responsible for the decomposition of organic matter is bacteria. So I just want us to, to think about this, because while I was reading these papers, which are fascinating reading, Margaret Chan, the director of the World Health Organization, gave a speech on the 14th of March in Denmark, okay, antimicrobial resistance in Europe and the rest of the world. And I've selected a few highlights of her speech. Okay, antimicrobial resistance is on the rise in Europe and elsewhere. I think the common term for these bacteria are superbugs. We know they're an issue here in Canada and in hospitals. The point is we are losing our first line antimicrobial agents. Okay, that's the point. These are her words. If this trend continues, this will be a post-antibiotic era. Can anybody imagine modern medicine without antibiotics? She's said that things as common as strep throat could once again kill. Okay, I just want us to think about this. I just want us to think about this. Terry Beveridge, the late Terry Beveridge, professor of microbiology, University of Guelph. Okay, fantastic guy, fantastic scientist. At the time, probably Canada's leading scientist and just an awesome human being. He more or less told me this was going to happen 30 years ago. 
Okay, we're overusing antibiotics. I just want us to think about that. And I don't mind telling you, I'm a guy that somehow contracted flesh-eating disease in 2003. And it's only through uh, a lot of luck and some fantastic doctors in Huntsville, Ontario, that I'm alive and that I have two legs. Because uh, normally what ha they had to cut out big chunks of my leg uh, because antibiotics just won't do the trick. These bacteria grow too fast. They generate toxins. The toxins attack the brain, the heart, the liver, the kidney. And normally you're dead within two days. So I've got to say this is my second chance at, at living and I'm enjoying it. I mean, that's why I'm here. This is just an awesome place to be. I just want us to think about what we're doing with antimicrobial agents, okay? That's, that's the message. That's the message here. Municipal water supply. Okay, the challenge in our cities is maintaining reliable supplies of clean drinking water with aging infrastructure, okay? And our cities are contributing to the problem in the sense that our storm waters are releasing nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus from, from our lawns, but also pesticides and bacteria, and then a wide range of contaminants. Cities are, cities are very dirty places. Now, mind you, you're talking with a guy that measures metals and ice cores that are thousands of years old, so I have my own definition of, of dirty. But again, just to give you an example, we're now back to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in the runoff water from our cities. These things are found in asphalt, and they're found in remarkably high concentrations in the sealant that's used on driveways. You know, we're talking about 3,500 parts per million of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which of course are going in particles, which of course are gonna be washing into our, our storm water. And where do we get these sealants from I was very intrigued to see in Fort McMurray, one of the products of the oil sand is, uh, is these sorts of products. So the picture I want to leave you with, yes, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are an issue in the oil sands, but they're also an issue in our, in our cities. Okay, again, something for us to think about. And again, the message is the more that we put into our water, the more that we have to take out before we can drink it. So when I look at a place like Edmonton, this was on the flight to Fort McMurray, wow. It's a huge city, and it's going to get bitter, bigger. Okay, this is the latest report from the Conference Board of Canada, and if you look at the projected growth numbers, Calgary and Edmonton in the next sort of 25, 30 years are probably gonna double. So again, we're already dealing with infrastructure and our cities are only gonna get bigger. So we do need to think about our municipal water supply systems. And the other issue, and, uh, and John very kindly mentioned this in his introduction, of the issue of drinking water in our First Nations communities, okay, including Alberta. Across Canada, more than 100 communities don't have access to clean drinking water. And I think that's a, a tragedy. Okay, other impacts on water quality. There's really too many to mention. In Alberta, there's more than 500,000 oil and gas wells. There's tens of thousands of kilometers of, of pipelines. There's 500 abandoned landfills. There's many other potential sources of contamination of our water that we do need to, to think about. So water quality monitoring. I've summarized this in one slide, and this shows the parameters that we're measuring in our water and how they've increased over the past 150 years. Okay, 150 years ago, a um, hundred years ago, we're interested in a handful of parameters to ensure our water is clean, but over time, the more we add to our water, okay, for example, um, uh, fallout radionuclides. In the past, we didn't have them. We only had them with the advent of atom bomb testing, nuclear power stations, and so on. We have to add more and more to our water quality monitoring. And the most recent ones, of course, things like the endocrine disruptors and, and uh, pesticides, trace metals, and this becomes more and more of a challenge, okay, and it becomes more and more expensive. So again, the message here is the more we add to our water, the more that we need to monitor it to ensure that it's meeting, meeting guidelines. So there's opportunities to learn from, from nature. And the first message here is that soil is an awesome water filter. Okay, soil is a fantastic water filter. So as water percolates through our soil, there's all kinds of filtration processes that are, that are happening here. 
Um, wetlands. Wetlands are also awesome water filters. A very important part of the landscape, and again, as the water slowly migrates through the peat in our bogs and our swamps, there's a natural cleansing process taking place here. So I want to give you two examples. Uh, natural filtration of water by soils. Uh, Springwater Township in southern Ontario, approximately uh, uh, 90 minutes uh, 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 north of Toronto. Uh, this is the artesian spring on our family farm property. And I've been testing this water. I've been sampling it using the clean lab methods that we use for the ice cores. And this is our clean lab in, in Heidelberg, our ICPMS. And when we were very, very careful about our measurements, um, in fact, we're so careful, we even filter the air where we're doing our water testing. So the water is sampled within a clean air cabinet so there's no dust particles in the air when we do our water sampling. We're now down to one part per trillion of lead. Okay, one part per trillion of lead is extremely low. To put that in perspective, it's five times less than the cleanest layers of ancient Arctic ice. This is very, very clean water. Okay, now if you compare that with the snow and the rain, we're looking at 99.995% lead removal. So soil is a fantastic filter for lead. That's the take home, take home message. And many other trace metals. In our soil, we have plant roots, okay, we have humus and humic acids, we have clay minerals, and we have all kinds of uh, microorganisms, and these things help us to, to filter, filter the water. And this little place in, in Elmville, we're developing the water into a, uh, a reference material for studying trace metals in, in water. The other uh, mention I want to make is the natural filtration of water by wetlands. And without going into details, swamps are fantastic filters for arsenic, molybdenum, selenium, uranium, copper, nickel, and vanadium. They're fantastic natural water filters. Okay, and constructed wetlands, constructed wetlands have been built around the world for treating wastewater. And that's a great thing to use a natural uh, analog to treat wastewater, fantastic. But if we look at these constructed wetlands and we look at a natural wetland that's evolved over the past 10,000 years, they really don't compare ecologically. Okay, they really don't compare ecologically. Maybe they function the same, but we don't have the same ecological functions as a natural, natural wetland. And one of my favorite wetlands in Alberta, the McClellan Lake Wetlands, 8,000 years of peat accumulation. It's up in the Athabasca area. It's an absolutely beautiful wetland. Okay, and there is a plan to mine oil sands from half of the wetland. So there's a plan in place, and it's still in the development uh, stages, the planning, uh, development of the plan, but the plan will be that half of the wetland will be mined, and the other half will not be affected. So I'm really intrigued to follow this story and to see how that is going to, that is going to work. Traditional Aboriginal knowledge. I was really uh, fascinated to learn that here on the prairies, the First Nations people have been managing the water for 2,000 years. I had no idea. And the way the prairies, First Nations did that, they didn't hunt the beaver. It was against their belief to hunt the beaver. And why is that? Because the beaver builds a dam and the dam stores the water. And that's their source of drinking water, but also for the bison, especially during drought. Okay, so this was actually very clever. And if you're living in the Stone Age and you have a stone axe, and you need some timbers, why not take advantage of the, the beaver? And I thought this was an awesome idea. And again, I had no idea in the prairie provinces of Canada that people had been managing the water resources here for 2,000 years by living together with the beaver. And uh, this is my favorite beaver pond. It was a pond 40 years ago. It's now a swamp. It's been filled with vegetation. Okay, this is a water reservoir, it's a water filter, it's, uh, it's a sink of atmospheric carbon dioxide, it's habitat, it's flood control, it's groundwater recharge. I think we have to do a rethink also on the value of our, our wetlands. The opportunity for agriculture. So where is the opportunity here? 
Remember this, a farm is a natural water filtration system. There's a tremendous opportunity here for water filtration. Our wetlands, you know, let's leave the remaining ones alone because they're, they're water filters and they're water reservoirs. And let's plant some more trees, especially in ripe, riparian areas. Trees remove airborne pollutants, they sequester our atmospheric carbon dioxide, they provide shade for streams, promote interception, reduce runoff, remove nutrients, uh, prevent stream erosion, provide habitat. I could go on and on. There's more benefits to trees than that, but I think you get the message. Trees are hugely, hugely important, especially in these riparian areas. So buffer strips. And I know there's efforts in, in Alberta already underway for these best management practices. I just wanted to remind you of the importance of these, these buffer strips. Okay, for, for physical reasons, you know, promoting infiltration, promoting water storage, preventing erosion, the physical entrapment of soil particles is very beneficial. We want to keep things from going into our streams and lakes. That's what these zones do. And also as chemical reactors. All kinds of chemical species are going to be removed here. So a riparian zone is also a chemical reactor helping to protect the quality of our, our surface waters. A farm stream should be heard but not seen. Okay, I, I also want to mention that I do have a small farm property in Elmvale, Ontario. My parents bought this property in 1972. This is what it looked like at the time. The farmer who rented it, there were cattle in the streams, uh, trampling the bank, terrible erosion problems on the Y River that goes through the property. But I noticed that where there are trees, and there weren't many, but where there were trees, there was less erosion. So I've planted, uh, with the help of family and friends, almost 25,000 trees on the property, more than 50 species since 1976. So I just wanted to say, I do practice what I preach, or at least I, I try to, at least as regards trees. Um, the two women who were living at the farm at the time, lovely women, Mary Johnson and Agnes Cummings, one day they said, Bill, what are you doing today? And I said, well, I'm planting some trees. You're doing what? Do you know how long it took us to kill those trees? <laughs> we cut them, we burned them, we poisoned them. They could not believe this. Now, I understand the importance of clearing forests for agriculture at the turn of the century. I understand all that. People needed to eat. I understand all that. But not along the river. That was a mistake. Because for me to regenerate those stream banks, I'm going to need several more lifetimes. And I think I'm only going to get one. So this is now a duty of, of my, my children. I, was, I, w I had to chuckle. A colleague of mine at the University of Alberta, Naomi Krogman, showed me this paper that she recently published. My grandfather would roll over in his grave uh, planting trees on the, on the family farm. So I know that there's resistance to change, but everything is changing, and we have to change with it, and we have to, we have to adapt. Five minutes? Great, Kent. Okay, the other thing I wanted to mention about uh, planting trees, it's amazing what happens when you plant a couple of trees. It's amazing the birds that have arrived at the, at the farm property. It's, it's really a, a transformation. And we also have uh, a couple of little wetlands, seasonal wetlands on the farm property. Um, so the, 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 the back part of the farm was never tile drained, and I wouldn't tile drain it simply because of the, the seasonal wetlands. And um, it's actually amazing. There's a, a species of crayfish that lives there, and it's no longer very common in Ontario because there has been so much drainage. And I just thought, well, that's, that's, that's one place where the, um, the crayfish won't have to worry about the, the, the tile drain. So I guess I'm sharing this with you because it's also been a great learning experience, and there's, there's really obvious benefits, benefits to, to nature. Not only the crayfish, the frogs, the ducks, et cetera, et cetera. This is a painting, The Farm Stream, by Franz Johnson. Franz Johnson was one of the founding members of the Group of Seven. He had an art school up in this area. This is another one of his paintings, The Beckoning Stream. And I think this is what our, what our streams should look like. Okay, it's much better for, for water quality and many, many other things. So where are we now? Limitations of science and technology. Not all of our, our water issues have to do with science and, and technology. 
Robert Sanford has said that in Canada, we need a new water ethic. We need to think about water differently, and I agree. And uh, before I met Robert, for, for, for many different reasons, I started a small water festival in, in the village of Elmville, near where we have our farm, near where we test this very, very clean water, because I thought people need to understand how clean this water really is. And this is our logo, Celebrate Water. It's a celebration of our water resources. If people understand water and its value, they're more motivated to protect that water for subsequent uh, generations. And I also created a foundation, the Elmville Foundation, which is a federally registered charity for environmental education. And you can find more information on, on the website. And it certainly helped to generate more awareness in that, that small, small section of uh, southern Ontario. Um, at the end of the day, what are we all most concerned with? If you talk with people, we're most concerned with our own health. Okay? It turns out that a benefit to our health, healthy ecosystems. Okay, healthy ecosystems. We all feel good when we go for a hike through the woods. It's now been documented why we feel good. Okay? And it's called cognitive restoration. And environmental psychologists have studied this and documented this. It really does help regenerate our brain to go for a walk in the woods. So the message here is healthy ecosystems contribute to healthy individuals. And at the end of the day, we're all interested in our health. At the opposite end of the scale, okay, environmental degradation contributes to poor health. And this is a study just published in, in uh, Australia. The presence of depression was linked to residents in areas of elevated salinity in Australia. Okay, and this is contributing to asthma, suicide, and heart disease. Okay, so on the other hand, environmental degradation uh, contributing to, to negative health. The opportunity for Alberta, Alberta is an awesome place, but there are some challenges. Um, again, I can't read this, okay, but uh, the essential challenges are we have a warming climate, we have disappearing glaciers, we have a booming economy, we have increasing industrialization, okay? So the amount of water per capita available fresh water is only going to decrease in future. So we have to be very conscious about how we're going to proceed. I love this illustration by Clive Dobson, A River Through Time, the evolution of our watersheds. Many of our watersheds, we've completely changed. And we've completely changed them in so many ways. The way for us to solve our water problems is to solve them collectively. Not isolated solutions, but real interdisciplinary work, bringing experts together from all of the disciplines and looking at watersheds in an integrated way. And I think John Kennelly has mentioned the University of Alberta Water Initiative, which is a tremendous opportunity to bring together all of this expertise and work on, on water together. Thanks very much for your attention.